Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus the Christ. I'm Pastor Mike Williams, and on behalf of our senior pastor, Jerry Mannery, I'd like to welcome you to We Are One United Methodist Church. We are a church that loves God, and we express that love of God by loving on God's people. We pray that this service bless you. Welcome. Hallelujah. Come on, let's lift up the name of God. Let's go ahead and start giving our God glory this morning, for this is the day that the Lord has made, and you ought to rejoice and be glad. Anybody glad in the day that the Lord has made, that we have one more opportunity to bless our God, to give Him glory, to give Him honor, to give Him worth, to, to lift His name on high. Hallelujah. Let's go ahead and start lifting up God's name this morning. Yahweh, we want you to be praised. We want you to be pleased with our worship. Be pleased with our life this morning, God. We give you all the glory. All the honor and all the praise for you are worthy this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He is whole and reigns with splendor. Our God, Yahweh. Sovereign King and full of wonder, our God Yahweh, 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 be praised, Yahweh, Yahweh. In front is wisdom, our God is Yahweh. None can describe Him or compare to Him. Sovereign King 
and full of wonder. You are our God to your way. None can describe or compare to him. For he's our God to your way. Your discipline, your sins of power. You're God, Yahweh. Be of the glory, now and forever. You're our God, we declare Yahweh. We sing it Yahweh. Yahweh. Be praised. Yahweh. Now, come on, let's give Yahweh glory. Let's give him honor this morning. For he's worthy. He's worthy. Be praised this morning. Hallelujah. using your time. Um, I will do a little skit just to explain uh, using time and experiences. I'm sorry. This year's theme is Sowing and Growing at 2020. Give her your time, talent, and treasure. I like that thing, Trey. It's kind of catchy. I like it, too. Sounds like something I would have thought of. Whatever, Trey. What's the problem? Well, I understand how good stewards give of their treasury and talent, but that nice lady, Miss Gwen, gave me time. I am a little confused. Did she mean give of your time by attending church? Well, Trey, attending church is good. However, giving up your time to serve in the church is what she is referring to. Like what, Mom? Like volunteering when Sister Sharon and Sister Lisa need help with the food pantry. Oh, yeah. Deuteronomy 15, 10. Give generously to the poor, not grudging, for the Lord your God will bless you in everything you do. Also, you give up your time by serving on the stewardship committee. A good steward will help others understand the importance of giving to God, giving to God's kingdom with our time, our talent, and our treasure. Yes, Mama, you're right. Because the Bible also says in Proverbs 11:25, the generous will prosper. Well, the generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. Well, I think you are all set for the stewardship campaign. Giving of your time by serving others in the church, volunteering at the church, and helping those in the church. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank God for this skill. Amen. Amen. That pretty much summed it up as far as stewardship and time. Amen. Amen. So thankful. Uh, we're just thankful for that. We uh, Just be mindful of our stewardship campaign. Uh, as I stated on last week, we will have it going on for the entire month. Uh, as we are preparing for our 2022, uh, we are one budget. Amen. So be mindful of that. We will have our pledge cards outside uh, as you all um, head out into the four-year area for everyone that's here physically. Please fill that out and get it to either myself or Gerald so we can begin to prepare for the 2022 We Are One budget. Amen. 
Amen. It is now time for tithing and offering. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. If you would like to pour into our ministry out there today virtually, you can give by texting 77977, that's real one, 77977, or you can mail in your checks to 1315 West McDowell Road, that's Jackson, Mississippi, 39204, again, that's 1315 West McDowell Road, Jackson, Mississippi, 39204, or you can download our Real One app. Again, you can download our Real One app. For everyone that's here physically on today, we will have both our orange and our blue buckets on the outside of the aisles directly out the benediction, benediction. And if you would like to physically pour into our uh, ministry on today, you can just pour your tithing offering into those buckets on your way out. Again, we want to thank everyone that's here physically and everyone that's out there virtually, virtually with us today. May God bless you. Have an awesome week. Hallelujah. Let's go ahead and stand to our feet this morning and let's make this place conducive for worship, conducive for God to come in and perform miracles, perform signs and perform wonders. What better way to worship our God than to sing of his goodness, to admonish him because he is a good God, because he's a faithful God. Even when we are unfaithful, even when we're faithless, he's still faithful. Amen. He's a good God unto us. And Lord, we thank you this morning. We sing of your goodness. We thank you that your goodness is forever chasing us, that it never leaves us, that you are righteous, that you are faithful, that you are true, and we love you this morning, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. In all my days, I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Cause all my life you have been faithful. Yes, Lord. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am made for. Oh, I will be of the goodness of God. Love your voice. You have led me through the fire and in darkest night. Yes, Lord, you are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. Because yeah. all my life you have been faithful. Yeah. And all my life you have been faithful. Oh, so good. Yeah. With every breath that I made.
Cause all my life you have been faithful. Anybody grateful for that this morning? All my life, God, you've been good. You've been good. You've been good. You've been good. With every breath that I made, I made both. I will sing. trust and believe that God is still with us. When we're running and we get tired, we can trust and believe that God will give us strength. That God will allow us to go through the valley. But when we go through the valley, we're not traveling alone. That God's grace, God's mercy, God's comfort, God's peace walks with us. Oh, what a good God. Amen. Well, good morning again, church. Brother Tay, thank you so much for leading us in worship this morning. God, thank you uh, for playing and for guiding us into this space. I want to thank you, each and every one of you, for coming out this morning. I also want to thank our pastor, uh, Jerry Mannery, for allowing me to speak this morning. You know, Pastor and First Lady there in Atlanta uh, with their family. His son, his grandson, played in a championship game last night. And, his, and Pastor, he loves his people. Pastor was trying to get on a plane <laughs> this morning 
to come to be with his people. But Minister Mitchell and I encouraged him to just stay, to rest, and to enjoy his family. So y'all keep, you, you keep them in, in, the pray, in your prayers uh, that when he does travel back, that he has safe travels. Amen. But this, this morning, we will continue. We will continue in our series on the parables of Jesus. You know, Tim Howard writes, a parable is an easily understood natural example to illustrate a not so easily understood spiritual lesson. He also writes, a parable is taking what one is particular in one particular custom and time and can easily understand to teach something about the spiritual realm and how it works. Dr. A.J. Levine, a Jewish, uh, a Jewish New Testament professor, says, Religion is supposed to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And she says that parables are designed to provoke and to indict. So this morning, we are going to engage and study the parable known as the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's found in chapter Luke, in, in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Our to- sermon topic is blind spot. Blind spot. Hear these words from the Lord out of Luke. Chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, demeaning Jesus, what is written in the law? What do you read there? The lawyer answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. I mean, he was moved with compassion. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these, Jesus says, do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of the robbers? The lawyer responded, he said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Lord God, we thank you for the time that you've given us to come together to uh, worship and magnify your holy name. God, as we enter into your, your this sermonic moment, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For God, you are our rock, our strength, and our redeemer. Let everyone say amen. Who is my neighbor? Prior to this question, this dialogue between Jesus and this lawyer, it says that Jesus was celebrating. He was rejoicing in the Holy Spirit. He had deployed 70 of his disciples to 
on a missionary journey to, to heal the sick and to spread the gospel of Jesus the Christ. That the kingdom of, of God was coming near. And then the 70 returned in a manner rejoicing, saying that even the demons submitted to us, Jesus. So Jesus was rejoicing. And then he began, he starts to pray. He says, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants, yes, Father, for, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by, by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is itself the Father, or who the Father is, except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Then turning to the disciples, Jesus said to them privately, He said, Blessed are the eyes, the eyes of, of what, you just, what you just saw. For I tell you that many, many prophets, many kings desire to see what you see but did not see it and hear what you hear, but did not hear it. And then Luke tells us at that very moment, Luke says, just then, in some versions of the Bible, it says, and behold, that means you want us to look at what's about to happen next. Pay close attention to what's about to happen next. A lawyer stood up to put Jesus to the test. Now, in Jewish culture, it is not uncommon for a teacher of the law and scribes and litigators of the law of Moses to engage in dialogue and healthy debate about the principles of the law of Moses. But the Greek word that Luke uses here, test, is the same word that was used when Jesus was led in the wilderness after his baptism and was tempted and tested by Satan. So the lawyer stood in a attempt to expose any weaknesses in Jesus' teaching. Here, his test begins with the question, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, this question is not unique to chapter 10 of Luke. For in Luke 18, a rich young ruler comes in and asks Jesus the same question. This here family is an important question to the first century Jews during that time. And our text says that Jesus, in verse 26, turns on the lawyer and by asking a question, you know how Jesus, how Jesus does it. He answers the question with the question. He says, what does the law of Moses say? How do you interpret the law? How do you understand it? How do you read it? And it's from that, it's from there that the lawyer begins to recite Deuteronomy 6 5 and Leviticus 19 18. You know, this is significant because it's believed that these two passages that this lawyer begins to recite is the summation of the entire law of Moses. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 6 is known as the Shema, which is the fundamental articles of their faith of the Jewish people. They were cited over and over again in worship. That is here now connected to verse chapter 19 in Leviticus. The lawyer then says, I know the answer to this question, Jesus. You know, if Tim Howard is here, he would tell you that lawyers don't ask a question that they don't already know the answer to. He says, the answer to this question, Jesus, is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Now, Jesus, I can imagine Jesus saying, man, why are you here trying to put me to the test? You already know the answer to this. You know what the law says. Now go and do what it says. Go and do this. Go and do this so that you shall have eternal life. Go and do this. Love the Lord completely. Love the Lord totally. Love the Lord without excuse, without exemption, perfectly. And continue to love the Lord perfectly without flaw, 
or without fail, and love your neighbor as yourself. When you do all of that, when you live up to the requirements, when you fulfill all the law that God says, when you do this, lawyer, you will inherit eternal life. Doing it perfectly every day, every moment. Can, can you see what Jesus is doing here? No, Jesus is trying to tell him that you can't do what the law of God requires of, of you to do to inherit eternal life. Yes, you, you may know the word. You may be able to recite a word or quote the word. But if you're going to receive the prize, the righteous end, which is eternal life, you got to dot every I and cross every T to do everything that the law requires of you. And, and this lawyer sits back. He, he hears what Jesus is saying. And, and now the exchange, this dialogue between the two, it, it, it goes a little off rail. It, it begins to shift. Luke says that the conversation should be over, but the lawyer desiring to justify himself asks another question. Who is my neighbor? Now, now watch how Luke frames this question. He, he says, designed to justify himself, meaning designed to prove his own righteousness and righteousness to certify his credentials and to ensure that Jesus does not have the upper hand on him, designed to justify himself. He says to Jesus, now who is my neighbor? Now, I just want to tell you that there is a danger of self-justification because I know it can be difficult to admit or to acknowledge that we can't live up to what God requires of us. And the lawyer attempts to prop himself up uh, on his own righteousness to establish himself in the presence of Jesus. Jesus, who is my neighbor? Notice he skips over Deuteronomy 6. So referring to the love of God and hops right into Leviticus 19. You know, he's examining that thing. He's doing what lawyers do. He tries to flip it around to see if he can discover a, a loophole. He's attempting to litigate who is and who is not his neighbor. Jesus, give me an interpretation because I know what Leviticus says. I know who Leviticus said is speaking to, but Jesus gives me legal ground so that I can negotiate who is my neighbor and who is not my neighbor. I need you to tell me, Jesus. I need you to know. I need to know who is us and who is them. Because when I know who us is and who they are, then I don't have to worry about them when things happen in their lives because they are not us and we are not them. Jesus, I need you to give me the qualifications of who my neighbor is so that when I see my neighbor living in a city where the public water supply is filled with lead and, and can possibly poison the people, I don't have to worry about them because they are not us. I need you, Jesus, to give me a way that I can determine who my neighbor is. So that when I see them being the victims of systemic and institutional problems, uh, that I don't have to worry about that, Jesus. Because that's them and not us. Jesus, tell me who they are so that I can decide who lives up to the standard of my personal preference, Jesus, who is my neighbor? And I want to say this morning that although this question was asked over 2,000 years ago, you know, this question is still one that we are grappling, grappling with uh, the implications of this question today. That, that who is my neighbor? Who do I have to love? Who do I have to be concerned with? Who do I have to walk with? Can I just stay within the barriers of my own 
comfortable social and religious and cultural identity, or do I have to step out and speak and, and walk and love the outsider? Who is my neighbor? And this man that Jesus knows, he Jesus knows that this man has a blind spot. It's, a, it's an area, it's an area of flaw or failure that prevents us from living up to the standard that God requires us. He has a blind spot. And Jesus knows that this man is attempting to prove his own righteousness to him. And Jesus knows that he got he has a blind spot. But love your neighbor. Yes, you want to, to know who your neighbor is because you're blind. You're trying to justify yourself. But Jesus is saying, I know what your blind spot is. I know what's going on in this passage. You have a problem with racism. You, you got a problem. Jesus knows that there is a group of people that the Jews look down on. That they believe that they're superior or, or greater than. But Jesus knows that there is one group of people that, that, know, that, that no Jew would say anything good about. Which is why the Good Samaritan is a problematic title to, to, to label this, this, this particular parable. Because the Jews hated the Samaritans. But it was, it was reciprocated. They, they were at odds with one another. You remember when, when Jesus met the woman at the well at Samarita, and, 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 and Samaritan and he asked her for some water and she says, why are you talking to me? And, and, and just the, the previous chapter of Luke Jesus sent someone to Samaria to, to prepare a place for him, and they wouldn't even invite, invite him in. And then so this, this lawyer is standing before Jesus to justify himself. And Jesus says, uh-uh, my brother, you believe yourself to be righteous, but I know what your weak spot is. I know what your blind spot is. You, you can stand up and sing amazing grace. You can quote all of the Torah. But Brother Lawyer, there is a blind spot. You got an issue with loving people who are not like you. Who is my neighbor? So here in, in verse 30 through 35, Jesus tells a parable. And in this parable, he takes the person that the lawyer hates the most and uses him to demonstrate the type of love that God is looking for. In, in, in his mind, the, 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 the Sama, the Sama, is, 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 this, this Samaritan is less than, than human. This Samaritan is racially inferior, so, so theologically inferior. And, and watch what Jesus does. Jesus takes this this, takes this person that he identifies with as inferior and lifts him up as a lesson to teach the Jewish lawyer the kind of love that God is looking for and that God expects. Jesus, as his master teacher, he begins, he says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, going from Jerusalem to Jericho is literally a trip down because it was believed because Jerusalem was believed to be three thousand feet above sea level, and Jericho is eight hundred to a thousand feet below sea level, which is about a four thousand foot descent. So, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and that that treacherous trial that that he was going down, he was rolling down this road when he fell onto that band of robbers. They robbed him. They stripped him. They beat him. They leave him there half dead. And they went on by their business. And here goes this man laying there in the middle of the road, half dead, bruised, bleeding, all hope of 
being saved is gone. And here's the creativity of Jesus. He says, and by chance, a priest was on his way down the road. And when he saw him, when he was seeing this man laying there bloody and beaten, the text says, when he saw him, he crossed the other side, crossed over to the other side of the road. The priest didn't help him. Likewise, a Levite was walking, and he sees the man in the middle of the road, and when he saw him, just like the priest, he crosses over to the other side. And that there's, a, there's a significant point here because you have to understand that just as the lawyer is reciting these, these passages in Deuteronomy and Leviticus to understand what the love of God requires, the priest and the Levite understand these laws as well. They understand the law of Moses. So, so what does the law say? They go into the opposite direction. They, 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 they move. They move in the opposite, opposite direction. But, but he says, this is a man laying here. Now, some believe that this is a Jewish man that's laying here. But here comes a Samaritan who has been subject to, to the Jews. I tell you what, y'all watched the game last night, right? Most of you watched the game last night. So, so I know you don't understand this language, but but maybe you'll understand this. You know there is some tension, some friction between Southern and JSU, right? Ooh, clearly, clearly there's some tension between Southern and JSU. So so let's say that a JSU football player was walking down the alley. And got robbed, beat, and was left there half dead. And here comes the president of JSU. Walk by him, not saying a word. I gotta go get to my family. Here comes Coach Sanders. Walk right by him. This is his player. He should show love and compassion, but he walks by and not saying a word. But then one of those brothers that was throwing blows last night, a son, sees him, and not only sees him, but shows compassion and runs over to this football player that he despises and takes care of him. So, so, so we have an understanding of what the environment of the Jericho Road was. We, we see the assault of the Jericho Road, and, and we see the disappointment. Could you imagine the disappointment if you was a, a Jew and you saw your priest and your Levi walk by you? If you were a JSU football player and you saw your president and your coach walk by you? But he says, there's a Samaritan. This unexpected person comes and have compassion. No, Jesus is trying to get this lawyer and, and us today to see that the kind of love that God is looking for is not a love that keeps us comfortable in our box. Not a love that's expressed to people who, who we identify with, but a love or, or who we live in the same neighborhood with or go to attend the same schools with. Jesus is trying to get the lawyer to understand that his neighbor is not necessarily the person that lives next to him. The Samaritan has compassion. You see, when the Samaritan saw him, the Samaritan was moved to action. As soon as the Samaritan sees him, his heart moves and he, and he instantly moves and, and goes and, and helps this, help this man. He says, this is what love does. Love will do. Love, love does not wait. Love, what love does, love does not leave for later what we need to do right now. 
you know, Martin Luther King, when preaching this sermon, he, he embellishes a little bit about this particular story. He says that maybe, maybe the priest and the Levite was going to talk to the committee about the, trump, the problems that they were having in the road. Maybe he, they were preparing to, to send someone out so they could prepare the road so it won't be uh, as dangerous. And, 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 you know, that's all, that's all good, but, but none of that helped this man lying in the middle of the road. He says, you, you have to understand that some of some problems that we have in our culture, friends, there are, there are long-term solutions, but when it comes to a man dying in the street, there are immediate solutions. And in this Samaritan, and this, this Samaritan that recognized that he can't say he loves someone and then leave the man. Dying in the middle of the road, when he sees him, he moves to action to help him. And, and, and watch what he does. He not only helps him, he pours out wine to, to, to clean the wound, and he puts oil on it to soothe the bruises, and he takes his garments and bandages them up. Now, I don't know what, where y'all from, but in my hood, you don't, you don't just pour out for the homie for just a little bit. You don't just pour, pour, pour. He pours out his wine. This is his personal stash that he was taking a, on a journey with him. He pours out his wine to clean the to clean the, the cuts and, and all the soothe the, the wounds. The Bible says he then picks him up and put him on his own animal. Which means that now he's going to walk so that the man that needs help is going to ride his animal, which, which, which means that he, since this man did, could, not, could not walk, he had to ride his own animal. He says he couldn't stand up on his own two feet. He says, hey, here's my animal. And he takes the wine, he cleans the wound, he takes the oil, and soothes the, and soothes the bruises. He takes the garments and he bandages him. And then he takes he takes him and put him on his animal and gives him a ride and he takes his money and goes to the inn and gives him the money for two entire days. He, 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 he gives him his American Express and say, hey, charge up. And if, if whatever, whatever else I have to give you, I'll give it to you when I come back. Just take care of this man. Just see how he's compassionate and He's authentic, and he moves to this. He moves to action, and then Jesus says to the lawyer, "Which one of these proves neighbor to the man who fell in the middle of the road?" So, so, so the lawyer came in verse twenty-five with his chest out, trying to prove that Jesus wasn't as smart as he as he claimed to be. He says, "Look, look." Look at the lawyer who came and stood and, and was self-justified. This lawyer was proud when he first walked up to Jesus. But then now this lawyer can't even fix his mouth to say the word Samaritan. He says, the one who shows mercy. <laughs> Jesus just popped his self-justification bubble. He, he just showed him that you can't live up to the law that you quote and know. And, and you're so busy trying to figure out who your neighbor is and who your neighbor isn't that you are blind to the fact that your responsibility is not to decide who your neighbor is or isn't, but your responsibility is just to act neighborly. Notice Jesus didn't answer his question. He didn't give him the answer to his question. He says, he, he he didn't give him the answer to his question, but he gives him a story to profile of what a neighbor is. He gives him a parable of, of a picture of a person acting neighborly. And, and, and maybe, maybe the Holy Spirit is telling us that it, it's saying that the way to eternal life does not rest in our ability to decide who is and who isn't. That the pathway is not built upon your self-justification, but your pathway to eternal life is showing the love and kindness of God to whoever is in need of love and kindness. 
Because when we do that, we see the law fulfilled. He knows the law of Moses, but he was lucky in the love of Christ. Christ says, since you can't name him, you go and do what he did. Go do likewise. Now this parable brings us back to verse 25. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And if you read this parable correctly, Jesus is telling the man, he's telling him, you can't do what it takes to earn eternal life. You and I can't do enough. We can't meet the standard. We can't live up to God's righteous requirements. But the good news, the great news, is that salvation, the salvation is all of God and all of grace. That although we can't live up to the standard, although we can't do everything right, although we have our blind spots, we have a Christ. That is, that is the light of the world, and with Christ, He enlightens us, and He allows us to see areas that we normally wouldn't be able to see. That we don't have to work to get eternal life. That we don't have to do. That all we have to do is depend on the grace and mercy of God. You see, we often look at this parable. And we refer to the Samaritan and, and, and the good deeds, which is good because it's in you. And all, sometimes this parable is looked upon as the man is the sinner and, and the Samaritan is, is Jesus. And Jesus comes and saves the man and then he will, which is good. But again, a parable, a parable is supposed to provoke us in the back. And if you leave feeling good, then the parable is not done its job. But if you leave thinking, what am I blind to? What are the areas? Where are, how am I not loving my neighbor? That, my friend, is when the parable of the Good Samaritan is done its job. Lord, we thank you. Thank you, God, for forgiving us again this time of faith for allowing us to hear your word, for challenging us, God, to move in love like you have called us to love. And also to understand, God, that although we may not live up to the same, that your grace is sufficient. So, God, we leave here wondering what are our blind spots but knowing that in Christ you have granted us the life to see. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And if you're out there and you know you know that you haven't connected with God if you want to connect with God's family, that something has moved you to want to become more and closer to God. The Word tells us that all we have to do is confess and believe. That we confess that, Lord, that, that Jesus is, is Lord and God has raised Him from the dead, that we shall be saved. And if that's you, we invite you to come. We have chairs up front. We invite you to come down and and, and, and make that confession because, you know, tomorrow is not promised. And that question of eternal life, you know, we said that grace, is, it's all grace and it's all God. But it's through grace that we can make that confession. It's through the work of Christ that we have an opportunity to be connected, reconciled back to God. 
So if you're out there, if you're on our online audience, if you want to know more about our church, if you have uh, said that prayer and want to connect with us, we ask that you DM us or email us. The information is on the screen. And if you're here, we ask that you come up front. Also know that on Wednesday nights at seven o'clock we have our hour, uh, our power hour is a hour of prayer and a uh, uh, is a hour of prayer and Bible study. We invite you. The information is on the screen. Now let us sing. So may the God of peace, the God of love, the God of compassion, may that God be with you as you leave this place. You may go in peace. And also, Brother Amos needs to see our Pastor Parish Committee for just a few moments up front.